right, so to kick it off, just want to give you a more detailed introduction to myself. My name is Nicole Appenzeller, and as Emily mentioned, I'm the city's first electric vehicle ombuds person. So I just started that role last month, and I'm going to be focused on connecting with stakeholders, city agencies, and the general public to make sure that we can accelerate our deployment of publicly available electric vehicle chargers. Um, and one of my main targets is to help facilitate the installation of 100 new level two chargers and 25 DC fast chargers over the next two year period. So that will involve working with different stakeholders at any point of the project timeline to identify pain points in the current process and help alleviate them so that we can all meet our shared electric vehicle goals together. Uh, next slide, please. Great, so let's just jump into our clean transportation goals. Uh, next slide. Um, starting by looking at our greenhouse gas emissions. So uh, when we think about different emissions by sector, transportation is the leading cause of our greenhouse gas emissions in San Francisco. Um, and that they, the emissions um, are 47% of our emissions. And as you can see on the breakdown on the right, um, the primary driver of that are our vehicles. Uh, so this is a huge area of opportunity for improvement in reducing our greenhouse gas emissions and overall air quality as a city. So um, that's what's driving a lot of our clean transportation policies and goals. Next slide, please. And overall, our vision in San Francisco is to be 100% uh, zero emissions by 2040. So we have a couple of milestone goals um, to reach that overall goal. And uh, as I mentioned previously, it's really our electric vehicle roadmap and our climate action plan uh, identifying those milestones. Next slide, please. And um, to help us do this, we partnered with the International Council on Clean Transportation to do a charging demand study. So we could look ahead and see what our estimated uh, projections are for electric vehicle adoption, as well as the associated charging demand. So. As you can see on this map here, we have a lot of charging stations that we need in order to meet our projected 2030 charging demand. And those are broken out into two different colors. Um, the red is a public level two charger. So that's what you think of as a charger that might be at a grocery store um, that has 240 volts and could provide you with a charge in a number of hours. And then we have more powerful public DC fast chargers, they're called. That's something that you might see along the highway that provides a faster charge. So if you're on a road trip, for example, you could plug in for 30 minutes and continue on your way. So um, at this point, based on our existing number of chargers, we need about 700 more level two chargers to meet our 2030 demands and um, 150 public DC fast chargers. And I'm like, maybe if you could help me, I just lost the screen up here. Uh, so, um, if not, I can I can definitely use this large screen. But if, if the slides um, could come back, that'd be helpful, and then I can um, look more at, at the audience. Um, so, as you can also see, we have a zip code level map here, identifying where the gaps are within our city. So, this is what we really use as a guiding document. So as we're pursuing different funding opportunities or identifying where we need to go next, we use this map to identify where our charging gaps are. And as you can expect, um, we have a lot of charging stations already available downtown in our corridors. But as we expand outward to our more residential communities, some of our underserved communities like Baby Hunters Point, for example, we're seeing a larger gap in charging stations. So as we identify opportunities to expand, we're pulling up this map and rechecking to see where we need to go next so that we can hopefully provide a, a, a fair distribution across our city and help to fulfill those gaps so they're not continuing to exist as we draw near to 2030. Uh, next slide, please. Great, and as Emily mentioned, you know, our climate action plan is one of our guiding documents. When we're thinking about our transportation goals, we're really honing in on the transportation and land use chapter. Uh, next slide, please. And for that chapter, the main strategy we're focused on in relation to electric vehicles is uh, strategy seven. So that's 
identifying where vehicle use is necessary, we want to accelerate the adoption to zero emission vehicles and to electric mobility options. So as you all know, we're a transit first city. So we want to have people use transit when possible. We don't want to put new folks into vehicles whenever possible, but for those folks that are currently driving vehicles, we want them to convert to a cleaner vehicle. When we think about zero emission vehicles, those can be electric vehicles or also hydrogen vehicles. We're not doing too much in the hydrogen space right now. So you'll see the bulk of my presentation is on electric vehicles. But that's something important to keep in mind as another zero emission uh, fuel source. Next slide, please. So as we think about some of the supporting actions for this strategy, these are a number of the actions that our department's currently supporting. So starting with public awareness, we know that the public needs more education and outreach around electric vehicles. So we want to do a more cohesive uh, public awareness campaign so we can bring everybody into the community up to speed on the benefits of electric vehicles and how they can participate in this transition, either through vehicle usage or e-mobility. Um, additionally, we want to expand public charging, which you'll hear a lot more about um, from me today. So that's looking at things like evaluating curbside charging for our city, which means um, putting charging at the street level so you can plug in when you when you park at the curb. Um, and also thinking about putting charging into 10% of our commercial garages and city-owned lots and garages. Because not only do we want you know, to help expand charging for our commercial uses, but the city wants to follow suit and also kind of walk the walk as well. And then finally, we're focusing on creating three fast charging hubs, uh, which is something kind of similar to a gas station. The idea is it's one site that has a, a high number of fast powered chargers so that you can pull in, get a quick charge and, and move on and have them centrally located um, next to businesses and other sites that could use that charging. So we can provide something that is more similar to kind of that gas station experience. And then uh, we're also thinking about fleet planning. So we're developing a plan to help our small fleets. So um, historically, some of our smaller fleets have increased barriers to electrify. So we want to make sure that they're brought along with the transition, as well as our city fleet. We have a, a lot of city vehicles, uh, and our goal is to get to you know 100% zero emission vehicles. So we want to bring along our city fleets in that transition as well, as as well as our medium and heavy duty vehicles. So when we think about those greenhouse gas emissions, our medium and heavy duty vehicles are major emitters. So we think that there's a lot of benefits to gain from electrifying those fleets, and we're starting to do some planning in that space now. And then finally, we're also exploring other mobility options like e-bikes. I'll touch on a pilot that we're just kicking off, um, but we have plans to launch an e-bike pilot and we want to continue expanding our exploration of e-bikes. As we know that maybe not everyone uses a vehicle, but based on whatever mode of transit or mobility they use, we want to think about electric options there too. Next slide, please. So um, thinking about those uh, strategies and supporting actions, I wanted to give you a high-level example of some of our current projects that we're actively working on. Uh, next slide. So starting off with the fast charging hub. So as I mentioned, this is kind of similar to a gas station model where we group uh, a number of fast, charger, fast chargers. And we're starting off with a disadvantaged community. So we want to make sure that our communities that lack access to charging are, are receiving benefits of uh, public charging. And if you know the market is not providing those solutions there, we want to use city dollars to help support uh, chargers. So we're looking at um, doing outreach and education in Bayview Hunters Point um, in order to potentially select a site. And that would be a fast charging hub with eight DC fast chargers. And it would use 100% renewable energy through SFPUC. So we're starting to kick off our outreach um, in Bayview Hunters Point to work with the community. So it's a community-led project and the community is engaged at each uh, part of the process because the last thing we want to do either is just drop in a charging station without engaging with the community. So that will be a community-led process that we're kicking off and uh, 
we're just moving forward with a selection of a community-based organization to help us do that work too. Next slide, please. Uh, we're also kicking off the e-bike pilot for app-based food deliveries that my colleague Anna is actually leading. And it involves having 30 participants who will receive an electric bike as well as training uh, and, and safety courses in order to use that bike and see how that uh, that experience compares to using a vehicle. So um, a benefit of this program is these app-based food delivery workers. So think uh, Uber Eats, DoorDash, or other workers um, involved in, in food deliveries could experience an e-bike and we'll be collecting data and telematics to understand what their experience is like. One of the benefits of those uh, participants is they get to keep the bike. So we're looking forward to collecting data um, and our hypothesis is going to be a better experience, going to lead to uh, more efficient deliveries and hopefully increased um, income for them. So we're excited to see uh, how our hypothesis stacks up. And this will also include that workforce training and development option. So we're working with a variety of partners to make sure that throughout the process, uh, drivers are getting uh, safety training and education so that they can be successful in using their bike. And this is a model that we hope to expand on too so that we can continue to collect more data uh, and increase e-bike usage in the city. Next slide, please. And then we're also um, thinking about the curbside space. So as I mentioned, curbside charging is something that we're considering. And as um, owners of the curb, we're working really close with SFMTA to identify opportunities and efficiencies for our, our future investments in EV charging. So one thing that we're doing um, currently is we're working again with the International Council on Clean Transportation to do a network um, EV network build out analysis. So um, our last report with them was a couple of years ago. So we want to reassess those charging demand figures to see um, if they still stand up or based on, off of you know, the status of the market now and battery technologies, if any of those numbers have changed. And then we're doing a cost benefit analysis. So looking across five different charging typologies, including multi-unit dwellings, single family homes, commercial, curbside, and workplace charging to see what the cost efficiencies are, what, what the costs and, and benefits are, so that with our limited city resources, we can make sure to fund our expansion as efficiently as possible. And through this practice, we're really um, applying a, a, a focus on curbside charging because 70% of our residents lack access to overnight parking and charging. So we see that as a huge gap that is, you know, very unique to San Francisco. So to date, we don't really have curbside charging applications, but as we've experienced over the last couple of years, the curb has kind of broken open when we think about curbside op opportunities and outdoor dining, for example. So we're also introducing the, the topic of charging into the mix. Think about what kind of use case we have for curbside charging in order to fulfill that gap kind of replicate the home charging experience for our residents that, that lack that access now. Next slide, please. And then finally, we're also doing um, some medium and heavy duty electric vehicle planning. Um, so as I mentioned, medium and heavy duty vehicles are major emitters of greenhouse gas emissions, and they are also impacting a lot of our underserved communities that are closer to freeways or depots. So uh, with California Energy Commission funding, we are conducting a blueprint uh, research project identifying the estimated charging needs specifically for medium and heavy duty vehicles and developing uh, a blueprint of where we need to put charging in order to meet our goal of supporting 10,000 medium and heavy duty vehicles becoming zero emissions by 2030. So this is involving engaging with our local fleets and we set up a technical advisory committee um, that's composed of different stakeholders from ED charging service providers to manufacturers to local fleets and our utilities to all part participate and provide their inputs. Um, and, and we're working also with our mapping partner, Google, to develop a map so we can identify exactly where the charging stations need to go 
as well as conducting research on policies and funding opportunities so that as part of this report, we can also identify how we can fund this map in the future. And what we've been successful with in the past is in the passenger vehicle space, we conducted a similar blueprint, and then we were able to go back to the California Energy Commission and apply for funding for implementation of projects. So we're hoping to apply that same model and approach for the medium and heavy duty vehicle space. Uh, next slide, please. So just transitioning into some of our policies and ordinances, you know, I know that you're all interested in what's going on in, in the policy and ordinance space. So I want to touch on some of our existing progress. Next slide, please. One thing we implement is the commercial garage EV charging ordinance. So this applies to commercial garages that are open to the public and have more than 100 parking spaces. And this is something that we currently implement as a team. So for those sites that are affected, they need to install 10% of charging within their site. And that can vary based on the power of the power level of the charging. They can either put in 10% of level two charging or a smaller number of high powered DC fast chargers. And the compliance date was January 1st of this year. But what we've experienced is there hasn't been a high level of compliance. And one of those reasons is a lot of businesses are still recovering from the pandemic. So taking that input into account, we are providing a grace period this year. So we're not thinking about enforcement at all, but still continuing to focus on education and outreach and working with our partners at the SFPD who manage the commercial garage parking permit process to provide outreach to garages and provide them with the support they need to either um, comply with the ordinance or pursue a waiver. So we also provide waivers. So if it's technically infeasible, um, there's not enough electrical capacity or there's financial reasons that the site can't comply, we do have a track where they can pursue a waiver. It is temporary. So um, they'll have between two to five years based on the waiver reason to kind of revisit the process in the future. And overall, our hope is, you know, as electrification um, becomes more popular, uh, prices will start to come down. But for the time being, we're really working one-on-one -on -one with sites to make sure that they have their questions answered and they can be connected with EV charging service providers, kind of shop around and see what um, financing structure works best for them. And um, if you have any specific questions on that, we always welcome them and welcome you to reach out in advance so that it's an adva advance of uh, this year ending uh, before we start to think about enforcement. You know, ultimately we want everyone to have a positive experience with this ordinance and have a positive experience learning about EV charging. So definitely welcome any specific questions you have around how this might apply to any of your sites. Um, next slide, please. Uh, we also have had some planning code updates occur in the last uh, year or so. So um, the San Francisco Board of Supervisors approved an ordinance updating the city's planning code to help expedite the installation of electric vehicles, um, electric vehicle charging stations. So in recent years, um, when installing EV charging stations, service providers were required to comply with policies that were originally written for gas stations and auto service centers. So some amendments that recently passed that apply to this planning code eliminate some of the bureaucratic delays and shorten the approval process for new charging stations. There's also some current activity happening right now. So the, the last ordinance was duplicated and it's currently being assessed right now by uh, the planning department. So the proposed ordinance would make amendments to the planning code to include new criteria for assessing whether to grant a conditional use authorization for fleet charging locations. So right now um, that is being assessed. When we think about fleet charging, uh, there are a lot of different stakeholders identifying uh, their fleet charging goals and they can range from something like a UPS fleet all the way to our autonomous vehicle fleets. So that's something that's actively being discussed right now to identify what those specific criteria are going to be for fleet charging applications. Next slide, please. And then finally, it's the, we also have the EV readiness ordinance code, uh, which has been in effect for a number of years. Uh, but uh, our friends at the SFPUC are 
uh, running an incentive program to offer funding for new construction projects. So this applies to commercial or residential new construction. But the idea is that if you're completing new construction, you want to make sure that um, some of, of those parking spots are EV ready. So that involves 10% of parking stalls to have EV charging equipment, and then having an additional 10% that kind of set up with electrical service and conduit for future expansion. Since we know it's going to be, uh, it's going to help with cost savings to do all that work up front. Um, if we need to go back into the ground or do any trenching down the line, that all adds cost. So being able to do this at the construction point it's going to be really valuable for future expansion needs, and the SFPUC is offering incentives to help with that work, upwards of $100,000. So if you are aware of any new construction projects, that's something important to take into con consideration. And um, I, ha I haven't mentioned this, but I'll make sure to provide these slides to the whole group so you can follow any of the, the resources that are linked. Next slide, please. And then finally, I just want to you know, welcome any interaction from um, the Chamber of Commerce on future policies. So if there's a, an existing policy um, that you have feedback on or you see opportunities for future policies, we definitely welcome your input and discussion around those. Um, you can always contact us at chargingmadeeasy at sfgov.org. That's kind of our general inbox. And I'll also be providing my personal contact information so if there's something that you want to find out more about um, or, uh, you know, one of our existing ordinances that you want to talk through and see how it applies to your business, you know, please reach out and let us know. We've also recently had a report conducted um, by uh, the Center of Law, Environment, and Energy from Berkeley um, assessing how we can actually fund our climate action plan. So there are a lot of policy ideas that came out of that. That was just uh, made available in November. So there aren't uh, any specific actions taking place yet, but that report, if you haven't seen it already, is um, is really interesting to see you know, what some of our short-term solutions and long-term solutions could be to actually fund the Climate Action Plan, which is estimated to require billions of dollars to actually enact. So I've included that link there as well. Uh, next slide, please. Great, so looking ahead, I just wanted to touch on a couple other opportunities we have for collaboration. Next slide. So um, as part of my new role, I'll be starting with doing a challenges assessment of our current pipeline to deploy public chargers. So I'll be working across our city agencies that are included in that process, the planning departments, and uh, working with stakeholder groups like yourselves to understand what the pain points are from your perspective so that I can complete a citywide analysis and start to develop a plan for some solutions to help expedite that process and alleviate some of those stress points. So I'll definitely continue to work with the chamber to make sure I can solicit um, input from all of you and invite you for any future working group opportunities. Uh, we're also looking to do more workforce development so this is something that's going to continue to be a priority as we think about electrification. We also want to consider workforce development. So uh, we're definitely keen to hear any uh, ideas you have about workforce development um, in the space or what we can hope to expand um, into as a city. And then finally, there's also a number of funding opportunities that are coming down. And I can get into those a little bit more in the next slide. And um, so uh, we're really excited that uh, in 2023, we're seeing more funding um, come down uh, for our electrification goals. So uh, there are billions of dollars that are starting to become available um, coming from the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act at the federal level, as well as from some of our state agencies like the California Energy Commission. Uh, we've already started to see some funding solic solicitations open. Um, for example, right now, uh, there's a $2.5 billion discretionary grant uh, opportunity from the Department of Transportation that's opened that offers up to $15 million um, per project that we are pursuing. 
and that is for publicly available charging uh, in corridor planning. So uh, this is, I think, our first opportunity as a city to really work across our agencies to cooperate and coordinate so that we can go after some of these dollars and, and hopefully secure them so that we can bring in millions of uh, federal funding dollars to help um, support our electrification goals. And then we're also seeing uh, funding come down from the California Energy Commission um, through different charging grants. Uh, so they're providing uh, different solicitations based on different charging levels. And we've already seen uh, two re recent solicitations, one focused on level two charging applications of 300 chargers or more. So we're thinking high volume uh, applications, as well as um, more high powered DC fast charger applications. And uh, for all of these funding opportunities, you know, we're working across the city to identify what kind of sites we have available, whether they're city owned or privately owned, identifying partners. So we actually um, are just closing a uh, request for proposals today where we're looking for um, private partners that have ideas to access this funds, whether they have real estate or have ideas on how to utilize city owned uh, real estate. We're starting to collect more requests for proposals and we plan to follow that model for any future funding solicitations so that we also have an idea who else is working in this space and we can identify potential partners that we can work um, in collaboration with to secure some of the, these funds. Um, next slide, please. And I uh, just wanted to highlight some priority areas as we think about these funding opportunities. We're seeing that there's a heavy emphasis on publicly accessible charging. So that's where we're, we're focusing a lot of our work, as well as um, our priority populations in disadvantaged and low income communities. So I've included a map here and a link, um, but this is also one of our kind of guiding maps outlining our disadvantaged and low income communities in San Francisco. Um, these are typically communities that are underserved and are receiving um, higher uh, burdens of poor air quality. So uh, we're really interested in expanding into those communities and taking a more community-led approach to make sure that we're working with community members and community-based organizations to bring them solutions that are going to work best for them. And that might be an EV charging station. It might be something like a mobility hub where we pair EV charging stations with uh, e-bike e share or e-scooters. So we're also thinking, you know, broader than just electric vehicles. Um, next slide, please. And then I think, you know, my, my main call to action to you is to contact me if you want to be a partner for a future site or for future charging opportunities and projects. So if you have an available site where you'd love to pursue electric vehicle charging, let's talk. We want to understand where these sites are across the city and work um, hand in hand with businesses and our community members to help serve them. So I really want everyone to feel comfortable reaching out to our department and um, to me specifically. And then next slide. And I also invite you all to sign up for our quarterly Clean Cities newsletter so you can um, stay informed of available incentives and available activities um, that our department's conducting. Uh, we also manage our Clean Cities Coalition for the city and county of San Francisco. And so that's a DOE-funded program that's focused on reducing petroleum usage. So uh, we maintain a quarterly newsletter. So uh, I've got the sign-up link in the slide as well so if you'd like to pursue that. Next slide. And then I just wanted to pause here and kind of open it up for questions. Um, in, in the final slide, I have my contact information. So uh, don't worry, I'm not walking away without providing that. But um, I can just pause here and open up for questions. Thank you, Nicole. Um, yeah, let's start with questions in the room. And for anyone on chat, please feel free to drop it in the chat. We'll read that out loud. Um, go for it. I, yeah. I just wanted to um, uh, make two shares. And I do have a question. Um, one is that um, when I charge my vehicle at Lucky's, I, I get a discount texted to me and say, hey, you can spend $5, get $5 off. So if you like, 
it would be nice to see um, other businesses maybe incorporate a program like that. Uh, two, I've seen get, uh, charging stations at gas stations. So I don't, I don't know if they're uh, open to, <laughs> these gas stations are open to having space for EVs, but that'd be nice to see. Uh, so you're not looking for like a shopping center or anything. Uh, and then my question is, um, have you looked into redundancy in case uh, there's no, in case uh, the power, there's a power outage? Um, it's, you know, one of our concerns is that EV drivers Yes, um, definitely. And that's something that we're doing a lot of research on. Uh, as we're assessing our city fleet, for example, we know we have a lot of emergency response vehicles. So we're thinking about, you know, what the, the redundancy solutions can be. And we know this, there can be a variety of opportunities, like battery storage, for example. But I think that is going to need to be a necessary part of the puzzle. So we don't have that figured out completely for the city yet, but we know that's going to have to be uh, something that's considered, especially for our, our uh, larger fleets to convert. Everyone wants to make sure that they're going to have reliable power and access to their, their vehicles in the case of a natural disaster, for example, or you know our recent floods where we need to have city vehicles or other vehicles uh, you know, like a plumber or an electrician be able to get out there to where they need. So I think we're looking at you know, different technologies, but I think battery storage is definitely something that, that comes to mind. And um, we hope to have uh, a whole section on that available as part of our medium and heavy duty blueprint. So we'll make sure to share that around once that's publicly available to identify some solutions that we're seeing based on our research. Two questions. Uh, one, we're going to, we have to build 80,000 new houses here in the next new short period of time. Is the power grid going to be sufficient to handle all of this? And are we taking steps for that? The second thing is, who's going to make money off of all this? You talk about we're going to get grants, we're going to spend tons of money, but someplace in the world, somebody's got to be making the money to pay back that kind of debt. Yeah. Uh, and then when you talk about the commercial garages having been forced basically to put these things in, who's going to pay them? Where are they going to get the money to do it? And what is their revenue stream? Is there a profit uh, margin associated for the garages or other people that have it? Uh, I'm concerned that you know, we're, we're pumping tons of money into this and nobody's getting any money back or going to pay the debt back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so to start with the green capacity question first, that's definitely something that we're all aware of, especially as we think about building electrification and pointing people to more electric appliances, um, just electrification on a broader scale. We're working really closely with PG&E and SFPUC, so our utilities in the area, to assess uh, potential grid impacts and grid reliability, as well as availability. So I'm working across both of those utilities to identify where we do have excess capacity and how we can identify tools for the public to, to use as well, because you can have a great idea to put a charging station in, but if you don't have the capacity or have to make a serious upgrades, that's adding costs to your charging installation project and could be the difference in you being able to complete it. So we're really trying to work in collaboration with the utilities to identify opportunities to um, increase capacity and also see where the pain points are so that we can identify where they need to make upgrades and identify what the cost share is going to be. So if that comes down to ratepayers or someone else like the site owner, we wanna make sure that that information can be made more transparent. So it's not a surprise down the line when you're just starting to explore charging for the first time. So hopefully more to come on that. And we're really looking to see how much, you know, how far we can push, you know, getting more information out to the public so that as we're all planning, uh, you know, charging projects, we're taking the grid into account uh, because that's going to be very important. And then in terms of revenue and return on investment, uh, there are opportunities to you know make a profit off of charging. So it's ultimately up to the charging, um, the charging, the charging station owner to assess you know where they want to set the pricing for their charging. So. As you mentioned, a uh, site might 
want to provide a discount or what we're seeing is some employers might provide free charging as an amenity to their employees. Um, but ultimately, a uh, site would have to work with an EV charging service provider to identify uh, what their fee schedule is going to look like and how they want to structure that. So um, they can choose to, uh, you know, apply a bit of an increase on, you know, what they're paying uh, the utility for that power and kind of pass that on to the user so that they can um, receive some profit that way. Or they can also work with their EV charging service provider to receive something that are called low carbon fuel standard uh, credits. So those are commonly referred to as LCFS credits. So the idea is that by um, putting in um, charging station, using clean energy sources, you're doing something good for the environment. So our California Air Resources Board has a program to help um, subsidize that and pass on those uh, benefits uh, financially to uh, the provider. So that can help the charging station owner um, offset some of those upfront costs, as well as a number of the incentive programs that are available right now. Um, based on, you know, the charging installation, and we all know each site is unique and different, you know, costs can widely vary, but uh, with, you know, the education and research up front, the charging site owner could identify, you know, what options are available to them and, and based off of their business plan and, you know, that fee structure that they can identify, they can determine if it's going to be something that's going to be reasonable for them or something that they might want to pursue in the future. I hope that helped to answer your question. Thanks, Nicole. Any other questions? I guess one last question, uh, Nicole. Uh, what has been the business engagement process um, for feedback? And if there are, for, I guess, no pun intended, but any other ways for us to better plug in <laughs> with you? I love it. Um, so to date, I've been doing a lot of engagement with small businesses uh, that have small fleets. So those are fleets, you know, that have uh, 10 vehicles or less, um, because again, the thinking is that, you know, some of those smaller fleets might not have uh, additional resources to electrify. The last thing you want them to be uh, doing is being the last ones to add onto the grid and maybe having to uh, receive some of those cost impacts associated with charging, uh, you know, electrical upgrades. So um, I've been working with them kind of through the lens of that medium and heavy duty blueprint planning. But in the future, as we hope to um, identify more charging opportunities within the city, we hope to expand on our relationship with the Chamber of Commerce and uh, solicit more inputs from businesses to identify opportunities for businesses to expand charging into their sites or you know, collaborate in other ways so that you all remain you know, updated and informed on the latest EV charging policies and funding opportunities and I mean, could pursue them and have that technical assistance from our team um, to help take that first step. Um, thank you, Nicole. Oh, 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 sorry, one more. Oh, we'll grab you this from online. Thank you. Um, uh, this is Timothy Burr speaking for those online. A um, couple of questions. Um, I think I saw in the action plan, and you may mention this, that the goal is for three fast charging hubs this year. What's the status of those and any like learnings so far or any surprises if we get those set up? Uh, yeah, so uh, that's part of a grant that we had funded through the California Energy Commission. Uh, so we just kicked that off this year. So our first pursuit is to start with that disadvantaged community location in the Baby Hunters Point. So to pursue that, we put out a request for proposals for a community-based organization to help us conduct community meetings. Um, so that can inform our site selection. So we just uh, you know, con confirmed a uh, recipient of the community-based organization funding and we'll be kicking off our community meetings in the fall. Uh, we're also working with our charging partner, EVGO, to assess uh, sites. So along with Bayview Hunters Point, we wanna assess other sites kind of within the city so we can offer two additional fast charging hubs. So we're working with EVGO to really identify that site criteria that's gonna be important for them, starting to do site assessments. 
So um, we don't expect to have any installation start this year. We'll be mainly focused on that community outreach and engagement as well as site selection. And then expect that next year we'll be pivoting more to kind of construction process. So thank you for that. And I'm super curious on this next question. Um, so there's no secret transit first, you know, there's a little bit of anti-car sentiment as well. Um, I sold my car in 2016 and I've been making it work. So I get that. Um, but it, sometimes you see that in city agencies as well. And I'll give you an example. We have a client that's an EV manufacturer and we learned that in the city of San Francisco, you can't get an individual parking permit. For example, if your personal vehicle weighs more than 6,000 pounds and like some of these vehicles, the battery weighs 2,000 pounds. So the weight is a little above that. And when we reached out to MTA about waivers, they were like, absolutely not. Heavier car means more danger, which I'm not disagreeing with necessarily. And by the way, there were some throwaway comments about charging infrastructure in the city that was super negative. And um, I just, you know, was kind of surprised because that was happening at the same time as I think it was the mayor's office was working on their sort of EV plan that you mentioned. So how are you working with MTA and is there a team over there? And, you know, is there an alignment on kind of the vision of having EV infrastructure and charging in the city? I, I'm personally concerned about that. Yeah, that's definitely something that we're working on. And I think that's a really astute observation. And um, like historically, you know, our, our city has really kind of been focused on transit and getting out of cars, but you know, we definitely acknowledge from our team that there's going to continue to remain you know, cars in our city, um, especially, and hopefully they'll all become electric vehicles soon. So we do have a really close relationship with our SFMTA team um, from the planning side and the parking management side. Um, ultimately, as I mentioned, you know, they they own uh, the curb, so we want to make sure that we're in lockstep with them to identify opportunities for EG, EV charging expansion and also understanding their priorities or limitations in the space. So, you know, we have daily contact with them and we're making sure to invite them to any of our projects so that they're well informed. And we're also working really closely with SFPUC to ensure from a utility standpoint, we're all working in coordination. So there's no surprises on the utility end when we have a great idea and we learned that there isn't great capacity, for example. Um, I think it is definitely, it continues to be a work in progress. And it, uh, as I mentioned, I think uh, one of a positive outcome of the pandemic was being able to reveal other uses for the curb. So that is something that we're actively pursuing uh, with, uh, SFMTA to identify opportunities to fill that gap and serve our residents that currently lack the access to overnight charging and therefore are not pursuing electric vehicles as an option. So um, for that specific example, we've been working really closely with MTA for the last two years to um, prioritize and research curbside charging so that we can inform their leadership and inform our priorities moving forward. So I think that's just one of the examples that's come to mind and that I've worked most, most closely on. Uh, but I definitely think it, it continues to be a work in progress. And definitely welcome any of that input as well. So as we do learn about those heavier vehicles, even a Rivian vehicle, you know, um, being past that, that weight limit, you know, I think a part of this too is just coming up against new challenges that they haven't experienced before. So a lot of that is starting with education and awareness of different teams and city agencies so that we can assess uh, solutions and identify you know, new policies for permitting if needed. Going back to the, which you mentioned several times, the, the owner of the curb, and you said that was this at FDA? Yes. Correct? They have a real pension for eliminating parking in the city. <laughs> and I'm concerned, now just my question is, uh, we have small businesses all over that are struggling to survive and depend critically on people being able to access their businesses with cars. So if you're not going to put a bunch of uh, chargers outside those um, businesses, you might argue, well, people will run in and shop while their cars are charging, but more than likely not. So. Then you implied that it was overnight. So during the day you could park there and then at night you would charge or how are you deciding where the spaces are and which one you're taking away? Yeah, so 
you know, we're not at that stage yet to actually make this the site selection, but something that we are exploring is residential charging. So just to actually, um, you know, re respond to that specific use case of our residents lacking access to overnight charging, we're starting by assessing uh, residential areas of the city to identify uh, how uh, the public would feel about uh, curbside charging coming in. And we conducted a survey uh, in, in 2021 with several neighborhoods to identify their thoughts uh, about EV charging stations uh, being offered in, in their neighborhoods. So for the specific application I'm thinking about, it would be in residential neighborhoods, something like a, a couple of charging stations every couple of blocks that would be available during the day or the nighttime. And we, you know, work to identify what those rules are, knowing that no one wants to wake up in the middle of the night and move their vehicle, but those, those charging stations would be available 24-7 um, and accessible on the curb. Uh, when it comes to kind of commercial uh, charging or charging closer to our, our businesses, we definitely know there are more um, competing curb usages. When we think about passenger zones, loading zones, you um, know, our bus stops. So at this point, we're not assessing um, those zones for curbside charging, but we know that they're all pieces of the puzzle. So as we're evaluating curbside charging feasibility for the, the city, we're also considering that as well. And that would, and just to confirm, you know, that would definitely be a process that we'd be engaging with the community on. So we can assess how different audiences uh, could be served and take into account any of those benefits or you know, potential impacts, as you mentioned. Awesome, and uh, some of you might have seen uh, in our newsletter, we sent out that small fleet survey. So if there's ever any materials, i um, happy to, to help engage our, our members as well. Thank you. Well, one last question here. Thank you. Uh, is maybe the only person here has built a substation in San Francisco in the last year. Um, we kind of glossed over the grid demands. Has anyone done a, like a rough magnitude of the marginal demand of the construction you're talking about from a load standpoint and approach? PGE is actually the, the rate the uh, utility provider not to receive for San Francisco uh, as to what it would take from them to add that kind of a load to the existing grid. I can tell you it's not there now. Um, and, and wait times for adding any marginal load in neighborhoods where the circuits aren't there is several years. Um, so the, the capacity we're talking about doing is it's pretty enormous. I was wondering if you guys have approached pg &E and said, hey, this is the marginal load we want to add to the grid. Let's identify the projects and start those down the pipeline because it's probably a 10 year, you know, timeline to get those into the ground. We haven't um, directly, but I know there have been some assessments done and there's specific areas that are kind of being built out uh, closer to the port, for example, uh, with increased capacity. That's something that we want to pursue with pg and &E and SFPUC, that, but we are kind of in the earlier stages of coordination with them. They each have um, capacity maps that they are utilizing and that we're trying to have updated more regularly to help inform our charging expansion. And uh, we definitely understand they're a critical component of planning. So uh, yeah. now, as I'm doing the challenges assessment, for example, you know, it's making sure that we're also uh, briefing pg and &E on the impacts that we're receiving because we have heard, you know, those wait times uh, are heavily impacting our users in the city. And a lot of the times it's also um, meaning that we can't, uh, sites cannot take advantage of some of the incentives that are being offered on a statewide scale uh, because of those longer wait times. So we definitely want to highlight that critical component for PG&E and identify you know, what some solutions could be, or you know those zones as as you've mentioned, uh, because we want we want to go after zones that are going to be uh, more viable. Uh, at least for you know the first phase of our charging expansion. Okay. Let me make it simpler. Do you guys have a number on the wall? Because by 2040, we need this much extra power in San Francisco. No. Okay. 
Great. Uh, any final thoughts from all? No, I, th I think this has been a really productive discussion and I uh, really appreciate all the questions. I would invite everyone to uh, take a look at our charging demand study that identifies what uh, those charging needs are uh, for the city uh, based on the level, of the number of level two and DC fast chargers and see how that relates to your business um, based on your zip code and also just kind of welcome uh, you know, open communication loops. So based on your individual experiences, uh, as you choose to potentially pursue EV charging, I'd love to hear your firsthand experiences on what's going uh, right and also what's going wrong, um, because I think that would just uh, keep us better informed as a city and um, hope to alleviate some of those impacts as we continue to grow in this space. So just want to thank you for inviting me again. Awesome. Thank you, Nicole. And uh, thank you everyone for attending here in person and online. Uh, our next event will be in the next month or so, um, hopefully around food waste. So if that's something you're interested in, um, uh, sign up for the next one. And if you have any questions about the series, please feel free to reach out.